Hey, my friends, we will be right back to the show, but I have a question for you. Are you struggling with the impact of childhood trauma? Well, know that you're not alone. I'm here to let you know that I'm starting a brand new weekly coaching group that includes a year of live coaching, accountability, support, habit and goal setting, and more. I'm starting a wait list for the group right now, and I'm only taking a handful of people. And I'll let you know that through this personalized coaching, we'll work together to help you understand how your childhood trauma has shaped your beliefs, behaviors, emotions, and will help you create a roadmap for healing and growth. Right now, you can schedule an absolutely free coaching session with me and get put on the wait list if you go to thinkunbroken.com. My friends, it's your time to turn your trauma into triumph, breakdowns into breakthroughs, and become the hero of your own story. And I'm here to support you in doing that. Just go to thinkunbroken.com to register for a free coaching call with me and to get put on the wait list for the brand new weekly coaching program. You're listening to the Think Unbroken podcast, and I'm your host, Michael Unbroken. I'm an author, speaker, coach, and advocate for adult survivors of childhood trauma and abuse. In this podcast, you will learn how to transform your trauma into triumph, turn breakdowns into breakthroughs, and go from victim to being the hero of your own story. You can learn more at thinkunbrokenpodcast.com. And of course, check us out on Apple Podcasts and Spotify at Think Unbroken Podcast. Hey, what's up, Unbroken Nation? Hope you're doing well. Welcome back to another episode with author Dr. Mark Gregory Karras, who is a licensed marriage and family therapist and full-time private practice in San Diego, and he specializes in religious trauma and men issues. Mark, my friend, welcome to the show. How are you today? Awesome. It's great to be here. I'm very excited about the conversation. Yeah, same. You know, you and I got to touch base and spend a little bit of time mm -hmm. together before recording this. And, you know, you and I are in very similar boat in terms of journeys and parallels in lots of different ways. And I think so are a lot of people who are going to listen to this episode. Uh, before we dive in, tell us a, a little bit about your background. Wow, a uh, background. Um, well, I could start off when I was, uh, you know, I think every person's family is a little dysfunctional. I think mine was on the charts, probably pretty wild. Um, but I think of my my background, I don't know if you want me to get into that level of background, but I'm, yeah, that's what what I think of. Just a really um, wild, crazy, topsy turvy abuse, drugs, violence. Uh, stepfather was in the pagans, motorcycle gang, uh, mom, a drug addict, drug dealer who did die of a drug overdose. Um, so, growing up in that milieu, and then my father, um, mental illness and abusive. And so, it was a pretty wild growing up in that. So I was pretty lost, disoriented, hopeless. I, I do think a saving grace was music. I did start playing the guitar. I was about 15. But all of that, I think, really shaped the trajectory of the rest of my life. Um, so with that, a little bit of background in a cutter and depressed and lost, I did have a profound spiritual experience that I would say was in the realm of the Christian tradition. Uh, at the age of around 21 and that, yeah, that I got out of one into another, but yeah, we could talk more about that. Um, yeah. Well, yeah. And we're certainly going to get into that. Mark, I'm wondering, one of the, the things I've been curious about is if, if someone were to really know you, yeah, I want to create, create a little context as we go deep into this. Sure. And you can include any of the background of your, your journey, your story that has led you to today. But what is, what is one thing that people really would need to understand about who you are to understand mm -hmm. who you are? Passionate. Yeah. Hung, uh, you know, there's one word, right? But I think hungry, passionate seeker. Um, just it's something that took me to this very moment of just seeking and hungering after truth after what it means to be more whole in the world. Um, a lot of my background, especially as I consider I have a master's in counseling and master's of divinity and a doctorate 
in uh, couple and family therapy. A lot of that is just wanting to work through my own, you know, and it was, I wouldn't change it for the world, even though it would cost a pretty penny, but I would not have changed that education and engagement with mentors and being challenged, inspired, called out, you name it. It's all shaped me to this very moment. Yeah. That's a strong word, man. And I, I think that when you look at anyone's journey, when they're actually wanting to change something about the world, mm. like you, you have to have that drive, you know, they're drive, the, yeah. the, the slings and arrows and the, the stabs in the back that leads one down this path are, are, are things that you have to be able to navigate and, and move through. And, and I would guess that your ability to do that, and I don't want to put words in your mouth, probably comes from having to build resiliency based off of what I hear was just an incredibly tumultuous childhood, you know, and I resonate mm -hmm. with you in a lot of ways as, you know, my mother was a drug addict and alcoholic. My stepfather was incredibly abusive. And, and I found myself as a kid, same moving to music and being like, okay, I, I can just keep these things in my ears all day long. It, mm -hmm. it creates this parameter of safety. What, when yeah. you, ref, when you reflect on that and you go back into that, that story and that journey, mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I think that a lot of people don't understand that it shapes you and it makes you it. Do you think that's yeah. true? Well, I, I do think that's true. I also think that the research certainly bears it out that what happens to us when we're younger has incredible ramifications for the shaping of our nervous system, our attitudes, our mindsets. Um, yeah, so it's, but there's an interesting piece of my family dynamic because I have two, a twin brother and a younger brother. My younger brother was, uh, is diagnosed with paranoid schizophrenia and he will be in prison for the rest of his life for murder. But in, in our, fa in our relational dynamics, I was the older brother, even though I was a twin by two minutes. And I think that older brother needing to protect, I mean, I got right in the middle when my stepfather was trying to beat the out of my younger brother, I was right there when I heard the pounding of the flesh of my stepfather beating my mom. I tried to this little kid, you know, trying to get in. So this sort of protector, this wanting to take care of, you know, it's interesting that even that piece within my family dynamics, well, look what I'm doing. I'm a therapist trying to help others and dedicated my life to this. And so it's so interesting that even that piece shaped me in a lot of ways too. Yeah. And, and I, I resonate with that. Obviously, you know, being a trauma coach and uh, helping people around the world literally just came from the same thing. It was like, mm -hmm. and, and I remember once I was having a conversation with two of my younger brothers, uh, just about the way that I kind of navigate the world. And it's, I, I think natively as men, we are generally speaking fixers. Um, I think that when you come from a traumatic background, you're always looking for solutions and trying to create parameters and frameworks of safety. And I would, with them, constantly be like, yo, this is the way that you do this. This is how you navigate the world. And, and one of them said to me one day something that was really powerful. They were like, we're, we're fine. We went through the uh, same. They were like, we went through the same you went through. You don't always have to try to save us. And I was like, oh, that's really interesting. And it made me think about how much, I don't know if it was shame or guilt or, or whatever it was that carried with me, but it led to this place where I was like, oh yeah, I don't actually have to try to help people, but, mm -hmm. but I do it. I do it because it's so fulfilling to know that we can create this change, that we can be the change in the world that we wish to see. Well, one of the difficult that. things about change, Mark, is when we look at change as a whole, especially in the spectrum of the society that we live in, so much of it is indoctrination, right? If you really get down into the, the baseline of what it is that is the Western human experience in the world that we live in the day that we live, a lot of it is indoctrination. And a lot of that indoctrination starts with religion. Mm -hmm. And so I would love to go into a little bit deeper about, about your background and what has led you through this um, path please with great detail, because I want to understand this. How does one start helping people with religious trauma? Well, I think, uh, first, if it's okay, I'll start with how I got into this whole thing. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, but, and then the helping, uh, could be, uh, another piece after, but I think, um, 
so, you know, I had that deeply profound spiritual experience and it was this Dis Damascus roads, uh, you know, so to go back a little bit, my twin brother became a Christian. He was in what's called one is Pentecostalism and a very, uh, fundamentalist, rigid, controlling, it was a very high control church kind of environment, but he would tell me about Jesus. And I'd be like, you know, I was a, you know, in my own mind, a rock star back then, you know, coming back from shows, uh, you know, I was in a progressive metal hardcore band. I'd be like, F you, you know, like, I don't want to hear that. You know, I don't want to hear about Jesus and all this love and not, but some interesting experiences started happening. Even in like my dreams, I had some pretty weird, wild experiences. Something was drawing me. And I just remember, you know, after some time being in a field all by myself, I was around the age of 21. And I said, the last words I said, sort of BC before Christ, if you will, uh, was, um, I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. If you're real, show yourself to me. And all I know is I, I consider myself a master deconstructionist. I have deconstructed every facet of my early uh, religious experiences, but I, it's hard to deconstruct that one. I just was enveloped by a love that was transcendent that I, I didn't muster up. There was no fog machine. There was no smoke. There was no community, you know, rallying me to anything. It would just be me by myself. And that just changed the rest of my life. But then I got into that one as Pentecostal church. And that was on one level, I felt love, but on another level, I couldn't hang out with people who believe differently. Um, I couldn't have long hair because there's some passage in, I think, uh, Corinthians where it talks about, don't you know that it's a shame for a man to long, have long hair? Women in that particular denomination couldn't even cut their hair because if they did, they would be in danger of hellfire. Like it was this very fear-based, constricted, control, controlled, authoritarian, coercive, manipulative environment mixed in with doses of love because that's a part of it, right? We're a community and you know, we're seeing each other three, four times a week. So that really ch shifted and, and changed a lot within me, but it also created such a, I would call it bondage. And this may sound weird to some listeners, but I got so rigid in myself with anxiety and fear of a punitive, angry God that I was afraid of drinking soda because I thought, I thought soda would defile the temple of the Holy Spirit. And I was, I, you know, it's so sad to even look back. Like if I listened to heavy metal, I thought like I would go to hell or, you know, I would like walk down the street and God would angrily punish me. Uh, so it was a very, that's sort of where a lot of my religious trauma came and, and then subsequently other experiences. And uh, yeah, so that's a little bit about what got me in this whole spiritual religious, then eventually come into contact with my own religious trauma. And then my clients, then people, groups and Facebook groups and social media, like something is going on. Now, one of the biggest studies on religious trauma just came out from the Global Center of Religious Research about two weeks ago. And then we have other groups that are formulating particular definitions of religious trauma so we can get into the academic and maybe the DSM, the sort of psychologist's uh, Bible, so to speak, to really, you know, give voice to this phenomenon that's really hurting a lot of people. Yeah. And, and I want to go in a little bit deeper and define this sure. in, in, in just a moment. Sure. But, but before then, because I want to create a little bit more depth of context. Sure. When, when I was young, so I grew up Mormon. Um, which I grew up Mormon in the hood, which is a really weird experience and Mormon in the hood with a mother who's a drug addict and alcoholic, right? So you you had to start all these layers. I didn't know anything different, right? right? And, and this tends to be the case scenario for many people. Um, I've had conversations with many people, both in, in person and publicly 
uh, about religious trauma because I was impacted incredibly negatively. Um, in fact, I walked away from the church at only 12 years old when mm. I read a passage in the Book of Mormon that says, "He without the dark, he with the dark skin will be will not be let through the gates of heaven." Mm. And I was like, "Oh, that's." because I'm pretty sure I'm brown. So this isn't going to end for me either way. Mm. And, and I went to war with my family over this, lots of pain and suffering and abuse because it was like, you, you will take me to church, but I promise you I'm going kicking and screaming and sometimes mm. bloodied. And, mm. and I, I stood by that. I still stand by that to this day. What I'm wondering and what I'm sure other people are wondering is how at 21 years old, Mark, does do you find yourself in this situation? Like what, what was, was it this thing where, where you felt like there was nothing else to hold on to? Were you just at a rock bottom and you were mm -hmm. taking the, the first ladder that falls into the ocean to pull you out? Like, like yeah. you're, uh, and I don't want this to come off the wrong way, but I sit across from me, I go, this is an incredibly studious, intelligent human being. How could this happen? <laughs> right. Um, I, like I said, I was. I literally, you know, I felt lost. I would cut myself because I thought the pain was so great within myself. I'm, I'm even like thinking about my younger version of myself that I would try to, I would just cut myself. I would take razor blades and just cut myself as a way to like symbolize the pain I was feeling on the inside, you know, um, and it sort of culminated it into, I, this may again sound strange, but at the age of 21, a little bit before, I tried to kill myself by sleeping with somebody who I thought had AIDS. So I know, I know this is strange, but like my mindset was, I just want to die a slow death. And at the time I knew a, a woman who it was a wild, crazy story. And well, suffice it to say, I, I didn't have AIDS, but that was my mindset. It probably was a couple of weeks later, along with this profound, I call it, now I've deconstructed and there's a phenomenon called sleep paralysis. But at the time, there was this experience where I was in my bed and I couldn't move and I couldn't speak. And I saw these like three like manifestations. They were red freaking the hell out. I didn't know what was going on. I tried to call out to my brother. I like was calling out to Jesus because my brother was talking about Jesus and it was still there. And I'm like, this isn't working. All I know is I woke up and I was, I was, um, I just broke down in tears. I felt traumatized. So with the depressed, lost, cutting that experience and then trying to kill myself, it was in that uh, season of my life where I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. And that's where something shifted, something happened. And I look back and I, you know, I can't deconstruct that in a way uh, because there was no one manipulating me. It was just me alone. But then I was thrown into that religious toxic environment. Um, I didn't know it at the time. This would take years later of then realizing uh, and then an experience that I had where I ran away from that cult into a, into college because I wasn't allowed to go to college. Like that's how authoritarian this pastor was being uh, because he wanted me to be quote, his armor bearer, which there's verses in the old Testament about, uh, you know, these armor bearers, um, taking care of the priests, the, the big royalty, you know, of God's agents. So he just wanted me to be his, like, go-to, you know, what do you need, pastor? Oh, well, I think, you know, this would be helpful. Okay, you got it. But then eventually there was an incident of him having an affair in the church with somebody. I was, and I remember this so vividly, he was arguing in, with his wife in front of me. I remember a snap, a literal physical snap in my chest. And I said, I got to get the f out of here. Mm -hmm. And I knew somebody at college at the time, and it must have been a few weeks later, I talked to somebody at the college, and I was there uh, and in college, and I, the first few months, man, there was times where I was on the floor in a fetal position, thinking I was going 
fucking insane because I didn't know what truth was. I didn't know what was real or what wasn't real. And so I had some panic attacks. It was very extremely disorienting. Yeah, I, I, I can only imagine. I mean, if you go from one extreme to another extreme to another extreme, the, the, the human organism is in flight or flight mode, freaking out entirely, trying to figure out how to navigate that. And, and what's so interesting about what I believe, and this is just, I'll speak from my own first person experience, mm -hmm. coming out of religion and trying to navigate the world felt insurmountable because the only thing that I had known was if you don't operate in this spectrum, you are going to burn for eternity. And, and I couldn't help but think, and, and I recall this in my late teens and even into my early twenties, just thinking to myself, like, why would you want to associate with this concept or idea of the fear of God? Right. And, mm. and to me, like sitting in that, it's like, we should live not in fear of, you know, whatever is in the afterlife, which none of us know, but instead go, okay, maybe if I can be a good person, you know, this will work out. And, and I often think to myself, Mark, I go, I, I am not religious. I am agnostic at best. I'm spiritual. I, I go universe, guide me, please, whatever. Right. And maybe that is in some facet, uh, a deeper spirituality. It's something I'll always be working through and trying to understand. And I've come to the conclusion, like if I get through and there are the gates of heaven and here we are with the saints and God stands there and he's like, I told you so. I'm like, cool. I great. Right. But mm -hmm. so many people are in the scenario where you were and they feel trapped and they feel stuck and they mm -hmm. feel that snap of the chest and like, I have mm -hmm. to get the out of here and, and yet they're they're so paralyzed right they're so paralyzed of the unknown and so i would love for you to not only define mm -hmm. religious trauma let's go into this a little bit more but let's yeah. talk about how people get indoctrinated and then what they do in the event that they're in this place where like i want to go to what's next yeah yeah so i'm gonna go with the um <clears throat> The Religious Trauma Institute and Reclamation Collective really came together to kind of have a succinct definition of religious trauma. So I want to share that because I think it's, uh, yeah, it's very precise. So religious trauma is the physical, emotional, or psychological response to religious beliefs, practices, or structures that is experienced by an individual as overwhelming or disruptive and has lasting adverse effects on a person's physical, mental, social, emotional, or spiritual well-being. So religious trauma, it's just, you know, trauma is just, you can't get over. Uh, that your nervous system and other facets is just, it has lasting adverse effects. So these are effects that were experienced in a religious context. And for me, they were the suffocating beliefs, the oppressive behaviors, the constricting rules, the confining structures, and they had a serious impact. And um, in a lot of, you know, in my book, part one kind of flushes that out between the debilitating anxiety, the effects on the body and understanding of the body and pleasure, toxic shame, nagging self-criticism, betrayal trauma, which is an interesting thing. And just rejection from the community, which, I mean, that in itself, you know, being that we are tribal creatures and we have evolved from that sort of scenario, being away from the tribe was a death sentence. So our brains still carry that over. Like, so to leave our community feels like a death sentence, you know, uh, from our nervous system perspective. And it's feels very dangerous and the rejection, what, how could you deconstruct that? How can you not believe that? And then you're thrown with, well, maybe you're hanging out with Satan, you know, maybe Satan's clouding your mind and then there it goes, Mark, you're in danger of hellfire. And so the title of my book is the diabolical Trinity healing religious trauma from a wrathful God, tormenting hell and a sinful self. For me, that is one trifecta of beliefs that many of us are indoctrinated with because you can't have a tormenting hell without a wrathful God to put you there. And you can't have a hell without evil, sinful people to be put at there. So 
the notion of original sin or the depravity of humankind or the sinfulness and primarily evil nature of humans, which was pounded and pulverized into me uh, with, you know, every church service. And then the idea of a punitive, wrathful God who, if you don't do the right thing, like, just think about that. Like this omnipotent, all-powerful God who had a snap of a finger and you read stories in the Old Testament, some in the New if you don't do what God says, he's going to open a can of whoop. And, you know, he burned people alive. He, I mean, kids are reading like the Noah's flood and stuff. And, you know, it's a very traumatic story, right? Uh, when you read in Noah's Ark and like, I, I think of like grandmas being drowned, and little babies being drowned and all these animals. Like that's not a good story to teach kids, but it's sort of a fun story that's talked about, you know, God saved a few and, but it's traumatic. It's like we're giving this image of a God who uses violent physical punishment to discipline. It's not okay. It's toxic. It's traumatizing. And there's plenty of research on what I'm talking about right now. Yeah. And, you know, I, I think often also, especially when it comes to the written scriptures, it's like you have to realize like a lot of that's hyperbole, right? I, I don't know of any living human being who ever survived living inside of a well. It's like, that's not a thing, right? And so can we take this with a grain of salt and sit in it and take it for what it is? And and it's not to say there aren't like powerful things in scripture, like thou yeah. shall not kill, like don't covet thy neighbor's wife. Like, yeah, we get that, right? Like that, those mm -hmm. things make sense and they're a great guide and, and maybe even a pillar concept for life. But the, the fear that comes along with that it, which you pointed to and the research along with it as well is, is something that I think people need to understand at a little bit more depth because uh, I would say from from my perspective and and again and this is mm -hmm. if you're religious like we're not on religion right I just want right. to be clear about that that's not what this conversation is this conversation is about exposing the reality of what it can be for many many people mm -hmm. and and what I'm wondering is to go a little bit further into the depths of this for for those who have this feeling these sensations of like this doesn't feel right this feels like pain indoctrination punishment hurt torment loss not community not love not joy not the things that you felt in that moment when you're like this is what i need to step into but instead the opposite they're mm -hmm. they're in constant fear of damnation and even though they follow all the rules it, it's so toxic which is a word i really don't like to use but in this case scenario i agree with it's so toxic that they feel like they would much rather for many people be dead than be in the religion any longer. Like mm. how, how does one remove themselves from this in, in a safe and healthy way? If that is even a possibility. Yeah. So first, just to address your point about religious, um, you know, I, I'm not. Hey, my friends, we will be right back to the show, but I have a question for you. Are you struggling with the impact of childhood trauma? Well, know that you're not alone. I'm here to let you know that I'm starting a brand new weekly coaching group that includes a year of live coaching, accountability, support, habit and goal setting, and more. I'm starting a wait list for the group right now, and I'm only taking a handful of people. And I'll let you know that through this personalized coaching, we'll work together to help you understand how your childhood trauma has shaped your beliefs, behaviors, emotions, and will help you create a roadmap for healing and growth. Right now, you can schedule an absolutely free coaching session with me and get put on the wait list if you go to thinkunbroken.com. My friends, it's your time to turn your trauma into triumph, breakdowns into breakthroughs, and become the hero of your own story. And I'm here to support you in doing that. Just go to thinkunbroken.com to register for a free coaching call with me and to get put on the wait list for the brand new weekly coaching program. We'll be right back to the show. But before we do, I want to tell you about today's sponsor, Factor Mills. Dot com, where if you go to factormills.com slash unbroken50 and use the code unbroken50, you can get 50% off your first order. That's factormills.com slash unbroken50. If you're like me and you are a person who is busy trying to create a life, heal, work on their health, wealth, and relationships, and not to mention deal with the day-to-days of normal life, you do not have time to be going to the grocery store and trying to figure out what you're going to cook 
every single day of the week. In fact, one time I did the math and I realized I was spending over 15 hours a week at the grocery store and cooking. When I added factor, I got to use that time for myself, for my family, for my friends, for my community, and for my business. And so if you're in the place where you need some more support in the kitchen, head to factormills.com slash unbroken50 and use the code unbroken50 to get 50% off. To bashing religion either. I think there are wonderful churches out there doing incredible and great things. This is just a, a particular form of theology that is discussed in such a way by preachers frothing at the mouth with venom and anger and mm. not working through their own trauma and their own pain and hurt people hurt people. And they're not That's... dealing with the wounded exiles within themselves. And so, yeah, I, that's where it's coming from. But it, there's definitely healthy spirituality. There's other people who can read the biblical text and look at the different genres, can look at the Adam and Eve story and, and glean things from that for our own context without needing to read it in a hyper-literal framework. So, you know, that's one point. But as far as people getting out of this, it's so layered because there's different people. Like I work with people, let's say, who are pastors and leaders in the church. Now, when your paycheck is tied to maintaining status quo, but within your heart, you know that it's incongruent with your current value system, that's so tricky to get out of that. So I'm thinking like that's one uh, group, but as someone who's just a congregate member or someone and they're trying to get out, it's so painful. It's not a overnight experience. It took me years. It's sort of these splinters that over time become so deep within your, your skin that it starts to pus and uh, get so red that you, you can't stay in any longer. Um, so it's a very tricky to get out because the, the pain of, you know, it, to, to go to a greater good that you don't know is it, so disorienting. It's so anxiety provoking, but it takes a village. And typically, you know, if anyone gets out of it, they could sometimes do it by themselves, but to have compassion witnesses being with them on the journey to help them to be part of their unholy huddle, those group of people who are in their corner helping them wrestle through all those things that other people in the church might call unholy. So it takes a community sometimes to get out and sometimes you can do it alone, but to do it well, uh, it definitely takes a village. Yeah, it, it certainly does. And one of the things I was thinking as you were going through that just now is how often people will take that step. They'll remove themselves or family and then be completely and utterly ostracized, right? Mm -hmm. You know, that, that is a part of this, unfortunately. And, and I, I wonder, like in, in your case, now heading into this space of, of college and being on the floor, having the panic attacks, mm -hmm. what were the steps that you took in your personal life at the beginning, like the day one steps? Uh, yeah. You know, it just so happened that while I was on the floor, um, it's just, I went to actually a Christian college, but it wasn't sort of a fundamental, so sort of the middle of the road, um, sort of evangelical, uh, not too sort of, uh, well, wasn't condemning much at all. But within that, I had a roommate who, gosh, there, it was people. I mean, that's the paradox. It was people who hurt me the most, yet it was people who took me by the hand as I was on the floor and, and then some mentors, people who believed in me and spoke life into me and called those things, which weren't as though they were. And it was those people who, yeah, just took me by the hand and led me to greener pastures within myself that were very spiritually oriented and not so much religiously oriented. So I'm, I'm so much in debt to those people. And, and as an avid reader, uh, they were my mentors too. 
you know, I was so passionate, so hungry, you know, so I think back on, on the, yeah, some books that were just transformative for me that were mentors from afar. So it was people, it was other people. And then hearing their experiences, podcasts and stuff weren't so big at the time. I don't even think that was a thing. I'm kind of old now, but that was, uh, yeah, those were some things that were really instrumental. I know the question people would want me to ask would be, what were some of those books? Oh, gosh. Back in the day, there was um, the Ragamuffin Gospel. Uh, the Ragamuffin Gospel. Um, there was a, just this old, wacky Brendan, Brendan Manning. Uh, that was one book, like religion, um, grace, 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 grace. I remember that book was like, oh my goodness, this was healing to my soul. There's a book by Henry Nowen, um, The Prodigal Son, which was pretty uh, powerful for me too. There again, it's just these mystics, uh, the spiritual uh, people, the writers that were pretty profound for me. Um, yeah. And then, yeah. And of course, much more books later on. Yeah. I've, I've come to find the same in my journey where it's like, whether they're near nor far, like find a mentor, find somebody who has the experience that you are having, who have been able to overcome it, to move through it. And, and like, if you leverage that in the same way as you've written this incredible book, it's like, there's mm -hmm. something there, there there's potential for people who are looking for it. Uh, I want to go into a little bit deeper. You mentioned the, the diabolical Trinity and mm -hmm. I want to go a little bit deeper in that and, and talk about the the relation of that concept and how it correlates with the trauma of religion ah mm -hmm. yeah so then the sort of the question is what i'm hearing it's almost like mark how does belief in an angry wrathful god in a afterlife that could be you know uh, like eternal torment like not a hundred years a thousand and ten thousand like a billion zillion. I mean, you can't even, which is unfathomable, but that's what people teach. Um, so, and then a view of self that is primarily sinful, where in our tradition, what I was getting fed just about every Sunday, our righteousness is as filthy rags. There's nothing good within us. Literally, we're like, this is what we're told. Your desires are fleshly and sinful emotions are bad. All that is good is your spiritual life. This also gets into issues around environment. Who cares about what happens here? Uh, but pastor, I, the homeless there, I, I want to be, Mark, what matters most is their soul. They could be fed and be full and go to hell for eternity. So all of these beliefs have major ramifications. I think you know, one is definitely on the nervous system. So this gets into the trauma that, uh, and the impact on the nervous system, this hypervigilance, this constant fear, this, I mean, it even gets deeper with me in the sense of in our tradition, this isn't every Christian tradition, but they believed in demons and demons were behind every bush. And I was told before I went into my English class, to plead the blood uh, of Jesus on the doorway so demons couldn't enter. You know, so is this like hypervigilant state where demons can get me, where God can get me, where I wasn't safe, where my loved ones could go to hell. And like if they died, I would be crushed and so fearful. So fear for breakfast, fear for lunch, fear for dinner. And that is going to create a nervous system that is hypervigilant that is just scared in the world, um, not very confident, not a very high view of self. So connect that to original sin, which says I'm primarily evil. Um, and they, there's a passage in the Old Testament where they say, you know, the heart is deceitfully wicked, wicked above all else. I, I was probably told that many, many hundreds of times and so many of other people in sort of the fundamentalist traditions but then that gets into the infusion of shame. And we know that shame is one of the, you know, biggest foundations for, I mean, if you believe you're a piece of shit, you do what pieces of shit do. 
I mean, if you have a low view of self, that's going to affect you in your life and your relationship with self and others. And so I had the confidence of a pinhead. I, I was a very low view of self. I hated myself, which is ironic because in the Hebrew and, and Christian tradition, you know, Jesus said, hey, what's the, he was asked, what's the greatest commandment? And to love God, to love your neighbor as yourself. But the loving of oneself, I've never, in all my years as a Christian, ever heard a sermon on, yeah, let's talk about the three points of how to love yourself well. You know, I got the love of self from the Buddhist tradition, from the Eastern tradition. Thank goodness it changed my life. And that gets into, you know, how to heal this crap. But the shame. You're no good, which then leads to the inner critic, because the more sham you have, the more fuel that gives your inner critic. So again, you know, hey, Mark, um, God hates you. Mark, if you do that, God's going to punish you with violence. Hey, Mark, if you didn't, don't, don't do that, then, you know, maybe God will curse you or just withdraw his presence. Or Mark, you know, oh, you're such a loser. You know, like all of these different, so the shame and the fear and the self-criticism so yeah it, it has deleterious effects for sure and it's all spelled out in the qualitative literature too in the research and then you know i was i'm not a member of the lgbtq community but then so much in that community just think of what it would be like to be gay and to be told that you are destined to hell because of what you believe is so intrinsic to who you are Right. So, so much of that in the literature as well. Yeah. And I mean, the, the way that you phrased it, uh, diabolical, I mean, I cannot think of a, a better way to phrase it. It's mm. like, it, it's like walking into something that you perceive as freeing and beautiful and safe while getting punched in the face. Right. Wow. It's yeah. it, like that to me is very diabolical. And, and I, I know the impact of this shame, especially around relationships and sexuality and identity. And it leads yeah. you to this place where, where you're constantly questioning validity. Like, honestly, Mark, it's still something to this day I deal with. And in a, yeah. a therapy session, not that too far in the distant past, like I sat and I talked, I was like, you know, growing up in the LDS church, we weren't in a polygamous sect. We were in, you know, standard and being baptized at eight years old and being told, you know, only save yourself for, for your wife and this and that created so many elements of shame in my life that like most normal human beings losing my virginity prior to marriage, even through the work, being a trauma coach for almost a decade, 13 mm -hmm. years of this, I was like, man, like there are still these moments where I can't even get connected intimately because of the shame and indoctrination of something that happened to me 30 years ago. Right. right. And so you, you think about the implications of this and like, thank God for therapy. Thank God for coaching and books and literature and, and mm -hmm. research studies. But it's still like the, those little seeds get buried in you. This oh. is what I always tell my clients, Mark. I tell every person I've ever coached, like, just trust me when I say that this is a rest of your life journey, mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. I, I promise you, I've read enough to have five. <laughs> PhDs, man. I, I, I've gone to my 400,000 hours of, of therapy and I am still yeah. doing the work. And, and I try yeah. to remind people that that is a part of this game. Like you're still going, no matter how much you yeah. go, a new layer will be uncovered. Almost in an ironic way, this thought comes to mind. There's an incredible preacher, um, Bishop T.D. Jakes, and yeah. he says, new levels, new devils. And right. I can't help but think about that in this moment, that as you get deeper into this journey, you hit a new level, there will be something new that is exposed. And, mm. and, and now this is where the guidance comes into play. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Mm. Where do people start the healing journey on this? Mm. Like if you were to give, if you were to lay out, maybe not a full and complete guide, because obviously we want people to, to read the book and go into depth there. But if yeah. you were to hit us two, three things, where do yeah. you start, man? This is yeah. heavy. This is, this is so heavy. Um, you know, part three of the book is helping people heal this stuff out, out, out from the nervous system. So I dedicate a hundred 
around 120 pages on practical, psychological, neuroscience-based ways to help heal the nervous system. But listen, I appreciate your honesty because it, I don't want to be a snake oil salesperson. I think I share this in a book. Like, this is a journey. You know, I, I'm not saying like, yeah, let me give you the five principles of healing and you're, you'll be set to go. You know, just follow this. It is a journey and there's so many different layers. And so I just want to invite that as you do sort of that compassion upon ourselves. It's not our faults. You know, we have brains and nervous systems that are just, it does the best that it can do. And our trauma responses are really initially trying to help us. And they just become so overactive and overworked and sort of the on switch becomes on uh, too often. It just has so many so harmful effects, but there's ways to heal. Um, and I wouldn't say, yeah, I'm more of a, how did I put it in my book? I'm going to share things that will promote healing, but I don't believe in a static state of healing. So let me name a few things that really stick out. Please. First, uh, community. I, I can't articulate that enough. I remember being so hungry and desperate. I said, um, like caring about what people thought. I need help. Like it gets to a point where, listen, you got to do what you got to do to get help. Um, you know, I know it's painful. I know it's hard. There's a lot of fear. I got rejected. Mark, I don't have time. Mark, that's not an issue that I, I really specialize in. Uh, Mark, your stuff is bringing up too much within me. Maybe, you know, talk to a liberal kind of folk who, but I, I'm a real proponent on healing uh, in community. So finding one or two people, if you can, uh, is so important. But let me share one of the biggest pathways to healing for the shame. And I think it's a subversive middle finger to religion and to a punitive, angry God who hates us. And you know what that is? That is the fine art of self-compassion. As I alluded to, it changed my life. There are hundreds and hundreds of research studies at this point. Every positive experience that a human can have is correlated with self-compassion at this point. So it's like pointless to do self-compassion studies because it, you know, it's only a good thing. So what does that mean? That means in a simple form, treating yourself as you would a dear friend who is suffering, right? You know, how, if you thought about um, a nephew, if you thought about a, ch a child, if you thought about someone you cared about and they're suffering and they have anxiety or self-critical thoughts or kicking their ass, you wouldn't beat them up. You know, so this whole idea of self-compassion, Kristen Neff, researcher, uh, huge work on self-compassion, but she breaks it down into three components. Uh, mindfulness, being aware, this is a moment of suffering. Second is common humanity. I'm not alone in what I'm experiencing right now because when we're suffering, sometimes we feel like we're the only ones. So that second piece of common humanity is really powerful. It was for me. And then third is now that I'm aware, now that I know that I am interconnected with many religious trauma survivors and trauma survivors in general, how can I extend compassion to myself in this moment? And it could be as simple as like, I, I feel I'm doing it sort of organically, putting my hand to my heart and just saying, I notice this is a moment of suffering. Mark, may you be kind to yourself. May you be well. May you know that you will get through this. That just taking a moment of pause, a few minutes out of your day, putting your hand to your heart, tapping into the inner pharmacy, maybe a little hit of oxytocin to ten, going into the tendon befriend system within the, you know, your nervous system there and just being kind to yourself, right? That just changed my life. That also gets into how I talk to myself, right? So this gets into, you know, working with the inner critic, 
Uh, so in my work, working with clients, helping them befriend their inner critic, which was so paradoxical because even in some religious traditions, they thought that was, they were told they were sa that was Satan. Oh, you're a loser. You won't amount to anything. Listen, you better not leave religion because you know, you're going to be in danger of going to hell, you know, or whatever it is. You call yourself spiritual. Give me a, oh, that's Satan. No, it's not Satan. It's not, and I know this may ruffle some feathers. Some people may believe in demons and Satan. That's cool. It's not where I'm at. But we do know from neuroscience that there is a part of us that we call the inner critic that is trying to be hard on ourselves, but its motivation is trying to help us avoid pain. And that's the paradox. So helping people be kind to their inner critic, know its motivation, uh, befriend it, and then what would self-compassion talk be in this moment? You were so hard on yourself and don't, you know, from yourself for doing that. But what would it be like if your brother was going through the same thing? What would you say to him? How could you say that to yourself at this moment? So that kind of self-compassion work. And let me point to one more piece in the self-compassion work. Kristen Neff talks about the yin and yang of self-compassion. There is sort of this motherly, nurturing self-compassion, which is beautiful. But sometimes there's the firefighter compassion going into a burning building and doing what you got to do to take care of business. And sometimes we need to do that for ourselves. What would be the most kind thing to do for myself? Hey, listen, um, I'm not going to take your ridicule of me in this moment. Uh, some people have you know, have parents who are throwing religion down their throat, uh, telling them about hell. And listen, mom, dad, I, I appreciate you're trying to do what you think is in my best interest, but I'm not okay with you bringing it up anymore. It doesn't make me feel good. It affects our relationship. So I would appreciate it if you didn't do that. That would be at the yang form of self-compassion where you're setting healthy boundaries for yourself. So that's what I love that self-compassion, self-love stuff. And I just didn't hear much of that in the Christian tradition at all. Yeah. For me, one of the things that has become a cornerstone of my journey is kindness. You know, kindness uh -huh. for self, kindness for mm -hmm. others. You know, if you grow up in the way that I and many people who are consuming this content grow up, kindness might as well be planet Pluto. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? I mm -hmm. guess planet Pluto's technically not a planet anymore. Uh, so whatever you get my right, point, right, right, whoever, right. whoever's going to email me about Pluto, it's fine. Um, but you know, I, I think about that frequently where it's like kindness above all, like it really truly, because that compassion is often the very thing that we were denied. And you will find in this journey, the thing that you did are denied is the very thing that you most desperately need. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and you find that as you step deeper into it, and even yeah. in my own journey, the willingness to the mark, the most uncomfortable thing that I deal with on a day to day basis in my life as a human being is mm -hmm. kindness, but it is mm -hmm. also the most predominant thing that I make a requirement. And so yeah. it's very much that firefighter thing that you just laid out because sometimes the hardest thing that you can do, and it sounds counterintuitive is like, be nice to yourself. Yeah. Right. Pull, support yourself, pull yourself up for force. I'm literally going to use this word, force yourself into doing the thing that, you know, you need to do. Mm -hmm. And, and, and my hope is that people do that through compassion, knowing that on yeah. the backside of those actions and decisions, it's the right thing to do. It's not doing it through pain, but doing it because you know, on the other side, you're going to reap the benefit of actually doing what you need. Yeah. Mark, th this so conversation has been really incredible, man. Um, before I ask you my last question, please tell everyone where they can find you. Sure. I, well, my, on my website, markgregorycaris.com, I am a social media dinosaur. So Facebook is going to be uh, where most people can find me and interact and chat with me and stuff. Um, and then, of course, my, my books are online and Amazon and all that good stuff. Yeah. And we'll put all the links in the show notes. Guys, go to thinkunbrokenpodcast.com. Look up Mark. And we will have all the links to this content, the books, and more right there at thinkunbrokenpodcast.com. My last question for you, my friend. Yeah. What does it mean to you to be unbroken? Mm -hmm. For me to be unbroken 
is I is to come to realize that I don't even like the word broken. Um, I'm not a car, uh, you know, I'm not broken because to be human, to be, to live in the world that we do is to experience some level of dis-ease. Um, I find that those who have no disease, I wonder if they are the mentally ill because you have to split off such a huge part of your experience to not see the chaos and the the hatred and the murder and the racism and every other kind of ism that's going out there. Like I said, we have makeups. We have a nervous system. We are not something that could be easily fixed that way. So for me to be unbroken is just to be okay with being human. And to be human means to be not okay sometimes. And I'm okay with that. Yeah. It's the being okay with not being okay. It's like, you're a human. It's fine. At the end, but it's all going to work out the same for all of us, right? Yeah. And thank you again for being here. Unbroken Nation, thank you for listening. Please like, comment, share, tell a friend, share this with someone because your effort, your energy of letting someone else find this content of delivering what we've just talked about could be the very thing that not only changes, but saves their life. And when you do that, you become a part of the bigger mission of ending generational trauma in our lifetime. So my friends, thank you for being here. And until next time, be unbroken. I'll see ya. Thank you so much for listening to Think Unbroken. Please share this episode with someone who could use it and help us move forward in our mission of ending generational trauma in our lifetime. And if you would, please take five seconds to pop on iTunes or Spotify, hit that five star, leave a review, and you can also reach out to us on social at Michael Unbroken or at Think Unbroken. And of course, you can check out our YouTube channel at Think Unbroken. Thank you for being a part of Unbroken Nation, my friends. And until next time, be unbroken. Hey, my friends, we will be right back to the show, but I have a question for you. Are you struggling with the impact of childhood trauma? Well, know that you're not alone. I'm here to let you know that I'm starting a brand new weekly coaching group that includes a year of live coaching, accountability, support, habit and goal setting, and more. I'm starting a wait list for the group right now, and I'm only taking a handful of people. And I'll let you know that through this personalized coaching, we'll work together to help you understand how your childhood trauma has shaped your beliefs, behaviors, emotions, and will help you create a roadmap for healing and growth. Right now, you can schedule an absolutely free coaching session with me and get put on the wait list if you go to thinkunbroken.com. My friends, it's your time to turn your trauma into triumph, breakdowns into breakthroughs, and become the hero of your own story. And I'm here to support you in doing that. Just go to thinkunbroken.com to register for a free coaching call with me and to get put on the wait list for the brand new weekly coaching program.